Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, you all virtually and in person to uh, one of our very special invited speaker um, uh, talks for sponsored by the Urban Health Collaborative. And today I'm really thrilled to welcome Dana Johnson, um, who is uh, joining us from Emory, where she is in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, Dana is a sleep epidemiologist, um, and uh, she received her graduate degrees from the University of Michigan, um, and also completed a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Harvard on sleep and circadian rhythms. Um, and her research, I mean, it's a really important uh, and also unique uh, area, which has to do with the contributions of sleep to cardiovascular disease and other chronic disease outcomes, which we know is so important. And as someone who has insomnia, I think about a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, also, most importantly, the connection to health inequities, which is really an area that Dana has focused on. And really, when this field was just starting and nobody was talking about sleep as a contributor to health disparities, uh, Dana was talking about it. So uh, very early on, and, and really, I think she has really, a, you're a leader in this field, I think, Dana, really, and, and I think uh, that's exemplified by all the work that she's done that you'll hear about. And I have to say <laughs> that I am very <laughs> honored, no, that was fun, but I'm very honored that Dana was one of my students mm -hmm. at the University of Michigan, and um, she uh, she got three master's <laughs> degrees and her PhD in epidemiology. And from the very beginning, when I first met Dana, uh, I was struck by Dana's, you have this incredible energy and push and commitment and perseverance, which is wonderful. And I, I you know, congratulate you. And yeah. she's done some terrific work. And and uh, we'll we'll tell us about it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Honor, for that touching and nice welcome. I'm so happy to be here and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is sleep. And so uh, for the presentation today, I'm really going to focus on talking about understanding and addressing sleep and cardiovascular inequities. Okay, let's see. I have to move the cursor into the PowerPoint. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I have no conflicts that are relevant to the presentation. So my goal today is to make four main points. So the first one is to convince you that sleep is an important determinant of health if you are not already convinced. Hopefully by the end, you will see the value in sleep and how it's connected to a number of health outcomes. My research is mainly in cardiovascular disease, so that'll be the main one that I talk about today, but know that sleep is connected to several health outcomes. And also that there are racial and ethnic disparities in sleep, in addition to socioeconomic. And I'll talk about some other um, inequities that we're seeing in sleep health and sleep disorders. And also that uh, there are multi-level contributors to sleep disparities. So I'll give you examples from empirical research that I've done, as well as others across different levels of the individual, household, and neighborhood uh, environment. And then lastly, uh, really the goal of my work is to think about intervening on sleep as this point to reduce cardiovascular inequities. And so, um, as I mentioned, sleep is an important determinant of health. So when we sleep, this is the time that our memories get consolidated. It's really important in terms of cognition. We see data that over time, people with uh, sleep apnea have a higher risk of dementia, and it's also related to cognitive decline. Also, it's important for emotional regulation. 
I'm sure we can all think about a time that we were sleep deprived and you were maybe a little moodier or irritated. So uh, sleep is really important for that emotional regulation. It's also important for our immune and inflammatory function. I'm sure many of you have heard when you're not feeling well, get some sleep. That's really important because it really acts to help repair your immune system and boost your immune system. It's also important for metabolism. This is the time where we have hormones that are secreted that control our, our appetite and our ability to feel hungry. So when we have shorter periods of sleep, there's alterations in that. Also, you're awake longer, which means you have more opportunity to consume calories. So short sleep is related to um, obesity as well as diabetes. And then lastly, cardiovascular regulation. This is a time when we have healing and repairing to our blood vessels when we're asleep. And so this is a table just showing uh, optimal sleep durations across the lifespan. So starting with newborns who sleep the most up to adults, who uh, the requirement is to sleep um, seven to eight hours. That is what is related to better health outcomes. And so we do see in older populations that sleep tends to decrease. And so the research question is really, is the need for sleep changing, which we don't think it is. So what's happening? Is this a, a consequence of medications or other health outcomes? And also we see sleep environments start, start to change in, in older populations to where they're less likely, or older adults rather, they're less likely to sleep in beds, more in chairs and couches and so on. So uh, this is really an opportunity uh, to really want to understand more about sleep and aging. So this is a figure just showing about circadian health. Uh, through the presentation, you'll mainly hear me talk about sleep health, but it's important to know that our sleep and wake, uh, wakefulness, our cycle is controlled by a circadian rhythm. And so we have many circadian rhythms in our, our, our body that control things like blood pressure. And so when we have a healthy clock, we have improved sleep quality and mood and metabolism and also decreased risk for disease. But know that this can be altered, our circadian rhythm and thinking about our sleep timing and so on, this can be altered by uh, shift work status. So really those who have a rotating um, shift, they're constantly changing their sleep and wake times. Also jet lag, aging, uh, having erratic uh, lifestyles. And so that can contribute to a disturbed clock, which can result in poor sleep quality and also um, uh, alter metabolism and cardiovascular health. And so this is really a, a bi-directional relationship between circadian and sleep health. They uh, really work hand in hand. And so uh, sleep disorders are highly prevalent, yet they are largely undiagnosed. And so we see the most common is insomnia uh, symptoms, which affect about 10 to 25 percent of the population. This is a condition in which there's a problem either initiating or maintaining sleep. And then there's sleep apnea, which is also a common sleep disorder in which there's an, uh, an obstruction in the airway, which causes uh, pauses or stops in breathing for at least 10 seconds every hour of the sleep period. And the prevalence is really a large range between 6 and 40 percent. It's dependent on a number of factors, including gender, um, obesity, for example, individuals that are obese. Uh, tend to have more of a restriction in the airway. Um, also, occupation. Football players have a higher prevalence of sleep, sleep apnea, particularly linebackers, because of the large neck. And then um, there's uh, periodic limb movements, restless leg syndrome, circadian rhythm disorders, which um, we don't know a lot about, uh, but uh, this is likely an underestimate at this 2%. And then these last two are really what we think of in terms of sleep health, dimensions of sleep health. And so sleep duration is most commonly studied in research, probably one because of the ease of measurement. Uh, and so we're seeing overall for adults, about 40% have a short sleep duration and that's sleeping less than seven hours on average. And then there's sleep difficulties, which can relate to insomnia symptoms or just in general poor sleep quality. And so, as I've mentioned, these can um, affect and operate through um, metabolism, inflammation, oxidative stress, the autonomic function, 
and that can contribute to different health outcomes. So now I wanna give you some information about sleep disparities and show some evidence around uh, what we're seeing. And so first I wanna offer this definition that I use in my research to define a sleep health disparity. And so this is a difference on one or more dimensions of sleep health. And so when we think about sleep health, we're really talking about sleep regularity, how consistent is your sleep across um, a week, uh, quality, alertness, so quality really also about satisfaction, how satisfied are you with your sleep, how alert are you doing uh, during wakefulness, do you have any sleepiness, um, also timing the position of your sleep within the night, if you sleep at night, uh, efficiency, how much of the sleep you're, how much of the night you're actually sleep, what percentage, and then duration. And so um, this difference on one of these dimensions on a consistent basis that adversely affects disadvantaged populations. So that's really the key here with this health disparities piece. And so in some of the studies I'll show you today, it'll have race as the exposure, but really I'm using that as a proxy for racism. And so race is not the risk factor. It's really this proxy for socioeconomic status or culture. And then also when we think about race, we're talking about measuring the social classification, how, um, how we're measuring different experiences uh, throughout life in our race conscious society. And so what we're really doing here in sleep disparities is hypothesizing about racism, not race, as this fundamental cause of uh, disparities in sleep. And so for racial ethnic disparities in sleep, we see that historically minoritized individuals have a high burden of sleep deficiencies and more sleep disorders. So this is a table from a paper that I published uh, just a few years ago where we were interested in understanding what's the state of the literature on sleep within these different uh, racial ethnic groups. And so from this paper, we saw that in general, American Indian um, and Alaskan Native and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were included to a far lesser extent than Black, Hispanic, or Asian individuals uh, in research studies. And so there's really not enough data to make some uh, conclusions on some of these sleep dimensions and disorders that um, I will discuss. But in general, we found that all of these groups have shorter sleep duration in comparison to non-Hispanic white individuals. And then for Asian and Black individuals, it was consistent that um, these individuals had worse sleep quality in comparison to non-Hispanic white individuals. But for Hispanic Latinos, the data were mixed. And this is because there is dependent on many categories. And this also are, um, goes back to that idea about what race really is. So it was dependent on things like country of origin, um, acculturation status, um, in some cases, skin color, really acting as a proxy for different experiences of discrimination. And so for those that reported more discrimination, we saw that their sleep more closely mimicked those of uh, Black individuals, whereas those that are lighter and maybe have less experiences, their sleep more closely mimic uh, those of non-Hispanic whites adults. And so in general, we see that these groups also had more severe sleep um, apnea. But what's interesting about this is if, when we think about it across the lifespan, we're also seeing an earlier onset of disease in these groups, particularly for sleep apnea. And of um, relevance is actually Asian individuals that had the highest prevalence of sleep apnea and most severe. And then for insomnia, um, we're also seeing that the data are mixed for, mixed for Black individuals, more consistent for Asian and Hispanic. But in doing some focus groups, we're lear learning that social desirability really comes into play when we're talking about insomnia. We see that the stigma around sleep is more common in Black individuals. The stigma being that sleep is considered uh, you're lazy if you sleep too much. 
And so when we, so this is self-reported, but we see when we actually measure their sleep using objective measures, they have a longer sleep latency. So it's taking them longer to fall asleep and also more wakefulness after sleep onset. So that points to there's likely insomnia, but on these questionnaires, we're seeing more under reports of these symptoms. Okay, so there's this is a figure showing data from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. This is using objective data at Tigerfee, where participants wore a monitor for seven days on their non-dominant wrist. This measures acceleration, and from there we estimate sleep-wake cycles. And so here we can see for Black, Hispanic, and Chinese individuals, they all had uh, shorter or a, a greater odds of short sleep duration in comparison to non-Hispanic white individuals um, at less than six hours. So for a Tigger fee, we use six hours as our, our cutoff. For self-report, we use seven hours. Self-report tends to be an hour over estimate of actual sleep. And so here from this figure, you can see that it's really the Black individuals um, that had almost a five-fold greater odds of short sleep duration in comparison to non-Hispanic white individuals. Now, in terms of insomnia, um, more recent data using different scales are showing that racial minorities do have a higher prevalence of insomnia and is often more severe. And so one study has shown that uh, racial minorities had a 67% increased odds of insomnia disorder with short sleep. So this is really an emerging phenotype. Um, it's referred to as the ISSP. So it's insomnia, short sleep phenotype that we're starting to see more in the cardiovascular literature. So with um, having insomnia and short sleep being related to cardiovascular disease. And I will show you um, a study um, supporting that. And then also racial minorities are two times more likely to exhibit chronic insomnia um, over a year period. So we think about circadian disparities. I did mention earlier that it's not a lot of work in this area, uh, but I recently published a review article and we found um, mainly the comparisons are black to white. So other racial groups are not um, included in this work. It's, so again, another opportunity for, for research. But here we see that African-Americans have a shorter endogenous circadian period, and they also have more complex responses to phase shifts, phase shifts. And so from this health equity piece, we also see that they're more likely to be shift workers. And so oftentimes they're working against their natural chronotype. So being really a morning type, but you're forced to operate as an evening type. So you have this discordance between your natural rhythm and um, based on your social and environmental demands, you're working on another schedule. And so this is just a table from the article um, that's just showing some of the comparisons across uh, these different measures of circadian factors. And so here's um, some uh, two figures uh, showing data from a national representative sample that really challenges our idea about this intersection of socioeconomic status and race and, and different gradients. So in this study, um, they uh, looked at occupation status or short sleep duration, the prevalence by different occupation um, groups. And so professional, we can think of as more higher SES, uh, support uh, as middle and laborers as low. The blue line represents black individuals while the orange relates to Latino and the gray white individuals. So here, for the sake of presentation, I'll just look at the left side for men. We see the highest prevalence of short sleep duration among African-American um, men. And the lower uh, prevalence within the Black group is among laborers. But we see a totally different gradient when we look at white individuals. You see what we would expect based on uh, what we've learned about higher SES, more opportunity, access to care, we see a lower prevalence of short sleep duration among the professionals and a higher one for laborers. And for the Hispanic Latino individuals in this study, the trend um, is, is less stark than for Black individuals, but we still see a higher prevalence uh, for those that are professionals. 
And then if you look at um, the figure on the, uh, your right for women, uh, we see that there's really no difference in the prevalence of short sleep duration when we compare black and white women that are laborers. It's essentially the same. The greatest disparity is among uh, this group of professionals for both men and women. Okay, you may say this is one study, right? So let's look at another. So this is, um, again, um, data from a national representative sample. This is using looking at the predicted probability of short sleep duration um, by these different racial groups and looking at education groups. And so we see an, the similar gradients. So here for Black individuals, the highest prevalence here, predicted probability, is for the college educated. And it's lower for those with less than a high school degree. You see the opposite for white individuals and um, also the similar gradient for Hispanic Latinos. So we're really seeing um, that higher SES Black individuals are likely more vulnerable um, to different stressors in these workplaces, perhaps, and other environments that are likely causing poor sleep in these higher um, SES groups. And so these are two studies, but now we're starting to see, you know, more and more in the literature. And so I'm not showing it today, but a, a paper that we published, actually one of my dissertation papers uh, from Jackson Carr study, when we looked at stress and sleep, it was the college educated black individuals that were most vulnerable to that association, not lower education. Okay, so now I wanna move in and show some um, empirical data around different multi-level determinants of sleep disparities. And so when we're really talking about understanding health inequities, we really point to, which I know uh, you all know in this room, uh, social determinants, and really thinking about this broad range of non-medical factors uh, that are social, economic, um, psychosocial, and behavioral that can either directly or indirectly uh, shape health outcomes. And so when we're thinking about upstream, we're really thinking about these economic and social opportunities and resources and how that may shape personal behavior, in this case, sleep uh, behaviors. And so what we're really hypothesizing here is that structural racism uh, is contributing to our environments, shaping uh, where we live and our uh, exposures within those environments. And so these are really the, refers to the macro level conditions, residential segregation is an example, that limit opportunities and resources and well-being of less privileged groups. And so this is just a figure, you know, showing how that may operate with the root cause being structural discrimination, racism, classism, and how that can affect our laws and budgetary decisions and someone that contributes uh, to our public health system, our education system, that we really think about uh, what's contributing to things like the wealth gap, and that can affect our health and well-being. And so the sleep field is far behind in studying things like structural racism. Uh, and so um, there is a, a commentary that I wrote, and I think one other paper um, on residential segregation, but um, we've been doing a lot of work and looking at neighborhood environments, and I'll show you some of that um, data. But first, I'm going to give an overview and show some of the determinants of sleep and circadian disparities that are happening across the lifespan and how they are multifactorial. And so starting with different social factors, I mentioned discrimination and stress, but also environmental factors. Uh, particularly things like inopportune light exposure, which can affect sleep and circadian rhythms, uh, environmental toxins, there's some work around air pollution and sleep, um, neighborhood violence and housing. We also know within um, a neighborhood environment, there could be a lot of variation within the home in terms of exposure to these different toxins. So the home could act as a um, barrier or facilitate, depending on the structure of the home, ventilation, and so on. And then there's sleep-related behaviors. And just to give an example, uh, relating uh, more upstream causes to consistent bedtimes, we know that a minimum wage is not a livable wage. And so those individuals 
um, sometimes are working multiple jobs, and so they may not be home to implement a consistent bedtime or have children that have a consistent bedtime. But often we're looking at this individual behavior and not thinking about the broader context that may be contributing uh, to individual behaviors. So we know that these can individually and cumulatively contribute to disparities in sleep health and disorders. And so here's a figure that um, we published and really thinking about this nested environment in which uh, the individual is within this uh, broader context with um, really challenging our clinicians to think about these other factors when making um, suggestions for sleep hygiene or even treatments, uh, they're gonna be affected by this broader context. So here we have um, obstructive sleep apnea, of course, sleep you know, at the core and how that's affected by different individual level factors. And then that's nested within different family structures, socioeconomic status and resources, which are also uh, nested within a broader uh, neighborhood context. And so there's also salient risk factors that we're seeing for racial minorities that affect uh, sleep health. And uh, most of my work are, is among African Americans, so that'll be uh, most of the examples you see. But here um, I, I'm listing several that relate to groups um, outside of African Americans. But um, here's a figure from a paper that um, Dr. Shanita C. Lee Jefferson published, who I saw is on the Zoom. And so this is really showing the history of African Americans um, in the US up to 2019, with 80% being you know, in these disadvantaged uh, circumstances. And so we're seeing that that's likely what's contributing to this wealth gap that we have that is hypothesized to um, contribute to health inequities. And then for other groups, we see that acculturation, particularly religious beliefs and practices, cultural beliefs about sleep can vary. And then also acculturative stress is highly related to uh, sleep. There's um, a lot of work out of the study of Latinos, the Hispanic Community Health um, Study, where um, they looked at acculturative stress and other um, exposures in relation to poor sleep among uh, that population. And then there's work-related stressors that tend to be salient for Asian uh, individuals being considered the model minority. This also translates to stress, and we see that that affects sleep. And then we have residual effects from um, residential segregation of minorities being forced to live in these non-resource-rich environments. And then we're also seeing anxiety regarding um, over-policing within these neighborhoods. And so this all, you know, is in, um, in line with the minority stress model, which suggests that minorities are experiencing a unique and chronic stress that's additive to the general stressors that all people experience. And that is what's contributing uh, to these um, health inequities, and in this case, sleep inequities. And so I'm going to start at the larger context and talking about neighborhood environments. And so your zip code is as important as your genetic code. And so you have Ana Diaz through here who, you know, has done really the start of all of this work around understanding neighborhood environment as a contributor to health inequities. And so we're, we're seeing this more and more in sleep with looking at different features of these environments. You know, whether you live in an environment where there's higher social cohesion, you're in an, or in an environment with more crime, uh, air pollution, vacant homes. There's actual data around um, interventions that has shown just cleaning up a vacant lot can decrease crime and increase perceptions of safety, which we know are related to health outcomes. Also access to green space. And then also I'll show you some data around um, living in a mobile home or trailer and uh, sleep health. And then lastly, again, thinking about that anxiety regarding policing. And so uh, recently we published this commentary uh, to talk about sleep deserts. It's really common that we have heard of and talk about food deserts, but to a lesser extent, are we thinking about our uh, sleep environment 
as potentially being a sleep desert. And so here we really just talk about how neighborhoods, some neighborhoods are not conducive to adequate sleep health and really calling for intervention there uh, to design homes intentionally to promote uh, sleep health. So here's a conceptual framework uh, that I use in my work and thinking about um, how our environment is contributing to sleep. We're starting with residential segregation by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic position, immigration status, how that bi-directionally relates to inequities in resource distribution. And so that can shape the social environment, which can operate through psychosocial factors such as mood or discrimination and stress. And we see that can directly relate to sleep health and circadian health. But it can also uh, operate through the physical environment. These are just some of the features. Um, and that can affect a person's opportunity for physical activity, for example which can lead to obesity, which is really bi-directionally related with sleep for some of the reasons I named earlier um, with the physiologic activities that happen during sleep that connect um, to uh, metabolism and so on. And so I wanna show you just some of the work we published um, from MESA, the Multi-Ethnic Study of Atherosclerosis, uh, which is a U.S. cardiovascular cohort study across six sites in the United States. And uh, it's now in its sixth exam, but I'm showing you data from the fifth exam where the neighborhood uh, ancillary study was conducted as well as the sleep ancillary study. So we have objective measures of both the, of both the neighborhood as well as um, sleep. And so um, in a lot of the work we do, we look at risk factors. Now, this was a time where we, um, we were able to look at a paper and think about what's beneficial for sleep. And so here we looked at social cohesion and safety, and then this overall measure of the social environment. And so we found um, in general that individuals who live in areas that um, they have higher ratings of social cohesion and safety, they're sleeping about almost 10 minutes longer on average. And so if you can think about just hitting snooze, that eight or 10 minutes can make a difference in how you feel throughout your day, right? And so, you know, again, the great part about Mesa is the diversity. And so we stratify the models to look at, um, you know, these different associations by race, ethnicity. Now, some of these groups have smaller sample sizes. So this is very exploratory, but we found that it was really the black individuals where there was an association and not one among the Hispanic, Asian or white individuals. So it was the black individuals that are really driving this association and um, seeing that, that um, living in these better social environments are relating to um, a, a longer sleep duration for black individuals. And then also um, we did a paper looking at the built environment. And here we thought about two different ways in which uh, it could potentially affect sleep health. And so on one side, the built environment can be a good thing, right? There could be more um, or an ease of physical activity because of sidewalks, they're more walkable, right? But on the other end, in terms of your sleep, it could be negative because there could be more traffic, a higher intersection density. Also with that, you have more, um, with more traffic, you get more um, uh, air pollution, traffic related air pollution. We actually see that Atlanta is one of the top cities for traffic related um, air pollution. And then there's um, more light exposure because you have more buildings and destinations. And then also the use of bright lights on sidewalks to deter crime. But if you're in a home that does not have blackout shades or you don't sleep with a sleep mask on, you're getting more inopportune light exposure. And then also there's more noise. And so again, using Mesa, um, we looked at these different features of the built environment, social destinations, intersection density, population dens density, and um, the walk score. And so the top shows um, the average mean difference in uh, sleep duration in the bottom is looking at um, odds ratios for short sleep duration. So in general, we found that negative side. So living in an environment 
with a higher walk score was associated with less sleep on average, a lower, a shorter sleep duration. Also, a higher odds of short sleep duration if you live in an area with a higher walk score. Some of the associations were consistent or null or the other measures of the built environment. And so similarly, we looked at um, these uh, different associations by race ethnicity. And we saw not only for Black individuals, but for Hispanic individuals, again, they were really the ones that were most vulnerable to that effect of the built environments on sleep. There were no associations observed for um, the white individuals and, and not for Chinese, but also the sample size is small for Chinese individuals uh, in the Mesa sleep ancillary. And so um, more recently, um, we, we have a paper that's under review where um, we looked at what may be explaining these racial disparities and sleep duration and thinking about the physical environment, again, using MESA data. And we found that uh, four to 38% or physical, the physical environment explained four to 38% of the variation, um, the Hispanic white difference in sleep duration. And this is um, using a formal mediation test. So again, this is cross-sectional data, so there are some limitations there, um, but we are seeing about 4 to 38%, depending on the metric, may be explained by the physical environment. And then moving to the household environment, um, we did a study looking at housing type uh, using data from um, the National Health Interview Survey, where we compared individuals who lived in a mobile home or trailer to those who live in an apartment or a house. So this is a very rough proxy of socioeconomic status. Um, but in general, we do see that for men, individuals that lived in a mobile home or trailer, they had a higher odds of short sleep duration and long sleep duration. And so what I didn't mention early on is that long sleep duration can be bad for health. Uh, it's a little bit more mixed because it's beneficial after a period of deprivation. So, um, so most consistent um, statements are really about short sleep duration, given long sleep is a little bit more complex. And then for women, we see that there was a higher odds of short sleep for those in a mobile home or trailer uh, compared to those who live in a house or apartment. Now, when we looked at racial disparities, uh, or um, stratifying these associations by race ethnicity, similar to those SES figures I showed you earlier, we saw that there was a difference for those that lived in homes or apartments with Black individuals having um, the higher prevalence of short sleep duration. And then for those um, in mobile homes or trailers, we either saw no difference or white individuals had worse sleep for those who live in mobile homes or trailers. So a different gradient based on living in a house or apartment versus living in a mobile home or trailer. Okay. Okay, and so um, one of my doctoral students just recently published this work where we were you know, also similarly interested in understanding from among adolescents. This is using data from the Ad Health Study. This is longitudinal data what may be explaining this racial disparity and sleep duration among younger uh, individuals. And we saw that um, doing these PATH models that household socioeconomic status mediated, partially mediated these associations. And so um, the, it explained about 12% uh, for African-Americans, 10% for American Indian, and 42% for Latinx. Um, adolescents that were in this study with the household environment explaining uh, some of the uh, difference in prevalence of sleep duration. And so I, I want to show you some of the data from Jackson Carr study. I was um, really fortunate to have worked with Jackson for my dissertation, but then also for my postdoc and also working with Jackson <laughs> as a fifth year you know, faculty member. Um, and so we were, we did an ancillary study uh, to Jackson, and if anybody is interested in analyzing the data, please reach out. Um, but here we were, we collected seven-day actigraphy, look at sleep patterns across time. We have in-home sleep apnea testing. They also had a clinic visit. 
and a number of other measures um, with also benefiting from the longitudinal uh, structure of Jackson, which is now in its fourth exam. And so here um, we're again at the household uh, level. Um, I, I created a household questionnaire based on um, the literature. And so we looked at different household um, features of the household environment. If we just look at the top part. So we looked at feelings of safety, um, physically being uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable temperature in the home, noise and light disturbance. And we created a score, a weighted score and an unweighted score. And we found that um, in general, there was no association with these individual um, measures of the um, household environment. But when we looked at the score, we saw that those who lived in a more adverse house environment, home environment, they slept on average about 14 minutes less than those that were in a more optimal household environment, but that's only for self-reported sleep duration. There was no association with objectively measured sleep, uh, except for, for sleep efficiency. There was a decrease in uh, a lower sleep efficiency, so which is a negative thing. So a higher sleep efficiency means sleeping more throughout the sleep period. Then we looked at in-home uh, or in-bed behaviors. So watching television, electronic use, eating in the bed. And we saw that individuals who had meals or snacks in the bed, they had a, um, a lower, a shorter sleep duration, almost nine minutes, and also a lower sleep efficiency. And then again, looking at the combination of these factors. So again, thinking about how all of these may operate together, we see that uh, those in, um, that are engaging in these um, behaviors in bed had a shorter sleep uh, duration, also a lower sleep efficiency, and um, more wakefulness after sleep onset. And so what we um, have done since this is really think about doing more focus groups to understand some of these exposures. And so what we're seeing oftentimes is that this television watching or electronic use is really being uh, used as a sense of safety. So in our focus group study, many of the individuals talked about um, not being able to sleep in a dark or quiet room because they would be vulnerable to break-ins, right? But according to sleep hygiene, we're telling people, you know, sleep in these dark, quiet rooms, but not thinking about, you know, these perceptions of safety. And so what's really likely happening, those measures are maybe a rough proxy for really this light exposure or noise um, exposure. So, and we know that exposure to light at night can alter the endocrine signaling, which can impair um, sleep. And also it contributes to weight gain. Same thing, it can disrupt the circadian clock. So again, these, um, uh, these different behaviors that are being used to increase safety are also harmful for sleep. So our challenge is to think about ways that we can alter this, um, whether it's you know, decreasing light levels using you know, different shades and so on, but we can really think about these interventions, um, how um, we need to adjust them to allow people to feel safe and adhere to sleep hygiene recommendations. So I'll, um, you know, the last empirical work for multi-level factors, I'll, I'll talk about some of the work we're doing around stress. And so um, in general, we know that stress contributes to poor sleep and other health outcomes. So here we were really interested in understanding how much of a burden is stress. I think many of us experience stress, but how much of a, a problem is it? So we use data from Cardia and looked at stress in relation to objective and subjective uh, measures. And so what you may see throughout um, some of the studies that I've shown you is that depending on how sleep is measured, you may see association or not. And we're really seeing that more um, exposures that are related to perceptions map to self-reported sleep, whereas when we're looking at objective measures, of whether it's environment or so on, that tends to map more with objective measures of sleep. So we're seeing this, this, um, this consistency based on uh, whether it's perceptions or objective. So here where they reported chronic burden, 
we saw that it was associated with a greater odds of short sleep duration um, using self-report and also um, poor sleep quality. This is using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is a measure of sleep quality. Higher is considered worse sleep quality. And then we only found an association among the Black individuals in the sample and not among um, the white individuals. And so um, we have moved towards understanding some of these stressors within um, the Black population, particularly in Atlanta. So I wanna show you some um, data for um, a study that it's a cohort study in Atlanta. Tanae Lewis is the um, principal investigator of the study. And so we, we've been looking at different um, measures of racism and how that relates to sleep quality. And so here's some, um, some work that we recently published and looking at gendered racial uh, microaggressions as well as um, other measures such as um, strong black woman stereotype and angry black women stereotype. And we see in general <laughs> that um, experiencing uh, these microaggressions were associated uh, with worse sleep quality. Now, while we did not do a formal mediation analysis for, for this work, we did include um, some of these variables in, um, or include some potential mediators to understand what may be happening. And we do see when we include depressive symptoms, we do see attenuation um, in the estimate of effect, for example, from microaggressions. And then also worry, um, if we include worry, we also see an attenuation. And so again, going back to this focus group work that we're doing, we're hearing um, individuals talk about uh, thinking at night about what happened during the day, how they should have responded. Um, we had one focus group uh, where people talked about when they had a doctor's appointment the next day, they were really thinking about how um, to talk about the different symptoms they have to make sure they have essentially they're spilled down uh, because they want to be perceived as knowing what they're talking about and so on. So this is really likely uh, contributing to um, rumination. And so we did look at that. And so here's um, just another table from that same study where we looked at race, uh, racism related events and found that it was associated with worse um, sleep quality. But then we also looked at um, rumination and again, I found a slight attenuation in the estimate, but we really are doing more work here to really understand um, uh, what may be explaining these associations. Okay, and so um, we looked at whether or not, or in trying to understand some of these, um, racial disparities and insomnia was the role of discrimination. And we did find that from a clinical sample that 57% um, of the racial difference in insomnia was explained by racial discrimination, which is consistent with some of this work that I've shown you. So we did a longitudinal um, analysis looking at discrimination and sleep quality um, where we actually just modeled uh, changes in um, discrimination status between baseline and follow-up. And we found that individuals that had low discrimination at baseline and had higher at follow-up, they had worse uh, sleep quality. And then cross-sectionally, uh, <laughs> we reported that sleep duration or discrimination was associated with higher odds of um, short sleep duration. So lastly, I'll end by talking about cardiovascular disease, which we know is a leading cause of death, accounting for 31% of all global deaths. And so, you know, there are established risk factors for cardiovascular disease, right? Hypertension, uh, obesity, and so on. And so uh, the American Heart Association a few years ago published a statement saying 80% can be prevented by targeting certain lifestyle factors. And here's the list. But what was missing from the list was sleep. Uh, but since then, this last year, uh, they added sleep to the essential eight and now are supporting sleep as a uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And so how this relates to my work and thinking about different stressors, whether it's environmental or individual level stressor, 
you know how these may contribute to sleep, which I've shown you. And now I'm going to show you this this um, this half of the the pathway that sleep may be related to um, cardiovascular health and likely might be this point of intervention. And so again, um, the same disparities that we see in sleep are existing overall in cardiovascular um, diseases. And so this is just to show you the pathway. There are laboratory studies that have been done um, testing the potential mechanism for how disturbed sleep can contribute to um, cardiovascular disease, which can operate through the sympathetic nervous activity and increase blood pressure and lead to cardiovascular disease through hypertension. Um, also can operate through um, these other pathways involving hormones and appetite or insulin secretion through obesity and diabetes. And so uh, that's for sleep duration mainly and sleep quality. But if we think about sleep apnea, so um, there's non cardiovascular related effects. Um, and I talked about memory, for example, but also increases in sleepiness and work performance. But they also can operate through these cardiovascular and metabolic pathways uh, to lead to different uh, consequences, which are all listed here. And so um, here's some longitudinal data from Mesa looking at sleep irregularity. So I mentioned um, how one of the dimensions of sleep health is sleep regularity, consistently sleeping. So here um, in this study, they found that having an irregular sleep pattern was associated with incident uh, cardiovascular disease. And this is using five years of data from um, Mesa. And so again, going towards you know, my work and thinking about these um, inequities, we know that healthy sleep can be altered by an opportune light exposure, adverse temperatures, diet, physical activity, st medications, stress, and neighborhood environment. And that can lead to a disturbed sleep cycle where we're seeing less um, restorative sleep. So less of our um, N3 sleep, our stage three sleep, we're getting more light sleep. And we're seeing that this is contributing to disparities in hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So I only have time to show you one example, but this is a study that um, you know, looked at um, racial differences in cardiometabolic disease and whether sleep duration or sleep efficiency explained it. They did a formal mediation test and a series of regression models. And here I'm just show, circling these estimates for the sake of presentation. But here we see that this estimate of effect is attenuated and no longer significant. And again, they did a formal mediation test and did find that sleep duration explained about 50% of the racial difference in cardiometabolic disease. And then for um, sleep efficiency, it explained, I think it was about 55% for this particular paper. So here's some work that I have that is in progress where we're looking at uh, these different measures of sleep regularity in Jackson and understanding how that uh, may relate to hypertension. And so here we looked at sleep onset timing, so how long it takes you to fall asleep. And so we saw that people that had more variation in the time it takes them to fall asleep across a week time, they had almost a two or a little over a twofold uh, greater odds of um, hypertension. And then the same thing with chronotype, being a definite morning type or definite evening was also associated with a greater odds of hypertension. And then we looked at sleep apnea in, related, in relation to resistant hypertension and found that it's really those that are in the more severe group. So individuals with moderate or severe sleep apnea have um, a greater odds of resistant hypertension, but not uncontrolled, but resistant. And again, looking at you know, the different categories of sleep apnea, there's a severity index here. So those that are in this most severe group are really the ones that are driving that association with uh, resistant hypertension. And so we have a few other articles we published, you know, looking at um, sleep and nighttime blood pressure and um, metabolism. 
So in summary, hopefully I convinced you that sleep is important and uh, that there are racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities um, that are likely the results of various structural factors. And in particular, based on the work that I've done, we're seeing that stress, discrimination, household, and neighborhood environments are all determinants of sleep disparities with particularly African-American and Hispanic individuals being particularly vulnerable to the effects of the neighborhood environment on sleep. And also that sleep is associated with cardiovascular health and maybe this point of intervention. And then I'll just end with talking about different ways in which we can um, advance the work that we're doing in sleep equity that could help uh, us reduce that um, the disparities, which may subsequently reduce cardiovascular disparities. And so, although you know, I it seems like I showed a lot of work around um, you know these studies that have. Uh, different racial minorities, but they were really the same studies, right? So, you know, really diversifying um, these different studies, but also including the groups that are being studied less at a larger uh, sample size so we can um, be able to understand more about sleep in those populations. And then the other piece is we've already documented that there's a disparity. And so growing this work is not in doing more comparisons. Yes, we need to do comparisons to understand if we have changed that, but now really there's a need to do more within group studies so we can understand what's driving these associations and what's potentially uh, the consequences of them within these groups that are most at risk. And then also there's a need to do screening and there are intervention studies that have shown that culturally tailored interventions um, as simple as, you know, including the people, um, concordance between patients or participants with the individuals that are on the website, we see um, more engagement in interventions. So really this need for culturally tailored uh, screening and also this need to identify determinants and also really understand more about structural racism as a contribution. And I recently published um, a commentary uh, with some methodological considerations uh, for doing this work. And then there's a need to address social determinants, not only for sleep inequities, but for overall um, health disparities. And then also advocating and supporting more equitable economic and social policies. And so there's um, a lot happening in the sleep world in terms of school start times. Uh, so with children that are particularly getting bused across uh, town are waking up at early as 5 a.m. And so we see that in first period, um, giving them um, testing, uh, they're doing worse than if they take the same test without additional opportunity to learn at 10 o'clock. So delaying that time can have advantages in terms of academic performance uh, for younger populations. And then I already mentioned about culturally tailored uh, interventions. And then I'll just show an example of a multi-level intervention um, where um, they implemented a sleep education program in schools and then conducted a media campaign. So there have been campaigns in other um, fields, uh, but we are not seeing that in sleep. And then they place a local sleep medicine specialist in the community and now are working on policy. So this is a good example of doing a multi-level intervention to improve sleep. So uh, thank you for listening. It went a whole hour. Uh, but I'm happy to answer questions or via email or uh, anything you can. So thank you. Thank you. I think we have, if people have to leave because they have something at noon, you can leave. But if not, we can take a few minutes for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, that was great, Dana. I think this is such a great example. I don't know if there are any students, you know, starting with a what was originally a very behavioral risk factor at the individual level that you were interested in and then really, really exploding it in terms of thinking about the social context of it and what that means. So I think that's yes. wonderful presentation. So we have some time for questions. Maybe can we uh, take that? Do you know how we can take this down so we can see the people on Zoom if they want? Yeah, go ahead, Lonnie. 
Yes. So, uh, Dana, thank you so much. Um, this presentation was um, amazing, and I've been keeping up with the American Heart Association and how now they're leading sleep as an additional indicator. Um, so I'm glad to see that um, that that your work has has really because I think that your work has helped to inform things like that, right? That, yeah. That's literally, because yeah, you've been, been doing this this research in this sleep space for some time. Right. Um, so kudos to you for that. Oh, thanks, <laughs> um, and and my one question, and you kind of touched upon this because you got into the stressors right. part of how it impacts sleep, but it also to me speaks to electronic use. And so mm -hmm. when I, I think about, you know, now more so than ever, we all have more access to, unfortunately, stress-related incidents that we can view. And it's one thing when you're viewing or experiencing stress-related things at work, right, right. every day, but then if I see a killing of a Black man on my phone before I go to bed, it's really hard to try right. and, like, block that out. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how that either compounds or, like, magnifies whatever the mental health struggles that might be um, embedded within individuals, how is that exacerbated then when you combining mm -hmm. with the electronic use? Yeah, great question. So the data we have are really from the focus group I mentioned where we did um, focus groups in Atlanta. And at the time it was right around the George Floyd uh, murder. So um, we were getting a lot of information uh, exactly about what you're, what you're speaking of. But unfortunately we didn't measure their sleep, but they talked about, um, you know, watching these different um, incidents online and then, you know, having anxiety, which we know also contributes to insomnia. And then also, you know, again, that rumination piece, like replaying things in their minds and so on. So I had, um, we just completed a, a pilot intervention where we did um, a mindfulness uh, intervention and we ask people to only do these breathing exercises at night and not use their phones. And we did see that those that were um, more adherent did uh, decrease the time it took them to fall asleep and they slept longer. We monitored their sleep for 35 days. Um, so um, while there's not a lot of work, I mean, I think your, your idea around it is exactly right. You know, it's gonna evoke these different feelings and we will see that you know, manifest through through our sleep patterns. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any hands on Zoom, but if anyone on it's Zoom is sharing, are there any questions in the chat? Oh, those are kudos. Kudos. Comments, basically. <laughs> yes, yes. If, there, if there are any uh, questions, anyone on Zoom, just uh, speak up. If not, yes. Please go Hi, ahead. Um, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if there's any. Um, preliminary data on relationship between um, sleep quality and duration and COVID outcomes? Yes, we actually just put in this really, really large uh, multi-site um, uh, uh, trial to look at um, sleep and long haul uh, COVID. So there's, there's definitely some work with really um, thinking about that immune dysfunction, but also, you know, exposure to COVID we're seeing less, you know, now, but um, there was definitely um, a good bit of work and really thinking more about the sleep quality piece and how that relates um, with, I think, uh, shift workers actually being um, some of those that were most vulnerable to um, not only depending on uh, whether or not they were hospital workers, but also just that rotation of their circadian rhythm made them more susceptible, perhaps weakening the immune system. And so um, whether this, you know, we'll have to see over time, like what that effect looks like. Um, I'm trying to think of the person. There's there's some groups that have been doing this work. I'm happy to send you some names if you want to see some of those articles. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, someone has typed something in the chat. Do you want to read? Can you read it? Um, I can read it. I can't. Um, I can't. Okay. Thank you so. Thank you for such a fantastic talk, Dr. Johnson. Appreciate the comments about the benefits of your mindfulness intervention and how these strategies can help participants cope with stressors that interfere with sleep, but that they cannot directly control. For example, racism and police brutality. Can you share your next steps for your intervention work? 
Yeah, so um, we're we're now designing a larger study. So what we we enrolled a diverse sample um, in Atlanta, and um, we measured their baseline sleep for about five days, and then um, asked them to do the mindfulness app every night, five to ten minutes um, sessions on stress reduction or and or coping with anxiety. And um, what we found, so after it was a mixed method study, and so we did focus groups after, and um, our racial minority participants really talked about wanting um, a concordance with the um, instructor that was doing the mindfulness. And so while we did see positive effect, what we're um, trying to do now is determine if we're gonna build an app or you know try and work with, which we worked with Headspace, uh, which were really great. We have a research contract with them to see if we can um, allow the app to do a matching of, you know, have this concordance on race and gender. Gender mat mattered a lot for our participants. So, um, so we are uh, right now um, in talks about that and um, writing an R01 that I hope that we'll put in in, in uh, July um, for the it's a special announcement for sleep disparities. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah.